Good morning. So I was listening to a podcast this week, and the interview was with a 99-year-old man uh, looking back on his life, and he talked about how he grew up in Minnesota, and this time of year, everything was be done by sleigh. And it made me really appreciative of having four-wheel drive, especially uh, with all the snow. So I was going to come up with some jokes about cars. I found it too exhausting. Just couldn't find the drive. Yeah, that was pretty exhausting, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, do you know why chicken coops only have two doors? Because if they had four, they'd be called the chicken sedan. All right. Well, moving on. Uh, we have connections throughout the week. The first one being Wise Women on Monday. That is at 11 o'clock at Bam Books in Eau Claire, and Bonnie's leading that. Next up, Tuesday, Tacos and Prayer at the Pulmazic Household. That starts at 6. This week, everybody is invited to our connection on Wednesday, which is the Chosen Advent Special here at Micon Cinemas at 7 o'clock. There are pre-order tickets, and the link for that is on the Facebook page. Uh, and we are trying to sell out the theater so we can get more showings and a bigger theater. So that's Wednesday, 7 o'clock. The Chosen uh, Advent Special is going to be playing here. Next up, I'm going to invite Peggy down for Advent. Kiara, that was the perfect song for our Advent devotion for today. Um, week three of Advent is called the Shepherd's Cam Candle, and it symbolizes joy, as in comfort and joy. Um, uh, sometimes we think that joy comes when everything is finally perfect, but rarely do things work out the way we hoped. Anticipation of finding the perfect gifts or finding time to make everyone's favorite Christmas treats, planning the Christmas parties, or just trying to coordinate the schedules of family and friends. No other time throughout the year has the higher potential to disappoint and steal away that elusive joy that we long for. The very first Christmas was certainly filled with, an unex with the unexpected and plans that didn't go anything like they were supposed to. A young woman daydreaming about her fiance and imagining her wedding day is greeted by an angelic visitation and all the plans that she had for her life vanished. A few days later, Mary hurries off to visit her cousin Elizabeth and she sings a song of joy um, from Luke Chapter 1, verse 46, Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in the God, my Savior. For he took notice of this lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows his mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be faithful. He made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his children forever. If ever there had should have been someone filled with worry and anxiety, it should have been Mary. Her entire life just got flipped upside down. She doesn't even know yet if she still has a fiance. But in what looks like the chaos of her life, she focuses on the God she has come to know. She knows that he is merciful. She knows that he is strong. She knows that he does good. And she knows that he keeps his promises. As she reflects on what she knows about who God is, her heart rejoices. During this Advent, may we, like Mary, take time to remember who God is. He is good, kind, merciful, and strong. No matter what uncertainty surrounds us, we can make space for joy. This week, there are two questions to reflect on. When have you known the deepest joy in your life? And how is your joy 
making a difference in the world. Please pray with, oh, they're all on. Yes, right? Is there only two or three? Please pray with me. Our God, the Father who sees us, we are trying really hard to make Christmas special and meaningful, and sometimes our best efforts seem to crumble in the dust in our hands. We want our expectations to be fulfilled, and we think that in that we will be filled with joy in the middle of our best efforts to control the chaos. Help us to stop, to pause, and to seek you, and to remember who you are and what you have done like Mary, you have done great things for us. You are reason enough for joy. During this special season of Advent, our longing for you, Jesus, may we be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust you, Father, so that we may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once upon a time, I was recovering from depression and God taught me something about happiness, that happiness is a momentary emotion, which is healthy and needed, but momentary. And joy is a belief that underlies all of your moments, regardless of whether they are happy. Um, what Peggy said about making our Christmases special struck me like that, like the idea that it's important for us to make our individual Christmases happy, but there is an underlying belief in all of them that brings us joy. Let's go ahead and stand or sit or whatever, and let's praise our reason.
beneath the starry sky. A mother holds a child to a night. All is calm and all is bright. She sings to him a lullaby. so often, Kiara, you play a song and it fits in an unexpected way, <laughs> kind of like what Peggy was saying. So thank you very much for your song selection. Um, Merry Christmas. We are in the last week of Job, and I think that's worth a celebration because <laughs> uh, I'm ready for some joy. I'm ready for some joy, and uh, it's hard to get joy sometimes in these stories. Um, but again, this is the Wisdom series, uh, three books, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, and now Job. And we're just kind of wrapping it up. There's a lot of verses and a lot of text in this. And I've been just trying to get like this pulse going for what God has been speaking to me about. Uh, last week, we were talking about spouses and friends. And uh, the question I had was, uh, integrity was the price that you place on yourself and what is that price what's your price that you would place on yourself to break your own integrity uh, this week <coughs> we are going to I didn't bring my clay if you have clay you guys need clay go get clay or jail could you go get them some clay so you have an assignment it's it's new clay and so you have to start working with it now so I'm gonna keep your hands busy and hopefully your head and your hands are gonna work together but my question or your assignment is, is if you could make an instrument, a device, that would allow you to accomplish everything that you'd want to accomplish, what would that look like? Okay, so this is your assignment. With your clay, I want you to create an instrument or a device that would allow you to accomplish everything that you'd like to accomplish 
so that you can go off and do other things, okay? So that's your assignment. This week, um, while you're, you're working your hands to the bone, um, we're going to be talking about one of Elijah's friends. Uh, his name was Elihu. And then we're also going to be talking about God's response to this whole story. So, But first, we're going to talk about Elihu. This is one of those Hebrew words that are, is not used anywhere else. There's no really good translation for it. If you look it up, it just says a friend of Job. Like, that's what it means. So <laughs> if you notice, I have never met an Elihu in my life. Probably why, I don't know. But he just shows up. There's no introduction. There's no explanation. He's just there amongst the friends. And then he, um, he starts speaking in the, at the beginning of chapter 32, and he goes on for six chapters. This one guy, one voice, one idea, okay? So he's really long-winded. He just keeps going on. I don't know if you have a friend like that, but they just keep going and going and going. This is Elihu. But um, he essentially affirms that God is just, and then he reaffirms that God always runs the universe according to the strict principle of justice. But then he introduces this nuance to say, he says, now listen, God might in his justice cause suffering to somebody ahead of time to shake their character in such a way that they'll become people who do the right thing in the future and so that they'll avoid future suffering and hardship. Again, God might, in his justice, cause suffering to somebody ahead of time to shake or shape their future in such a way that they'll become people who do the right thing in the future and so to avoid future suffering and hardship. And that's basically, if you take the six chapters, it's kind of where he comes to it. He tells this story about God sending a bad dream and causing someone to suffer in their sleep so when they wake up, they make a good decision. Well, that, that I could deal with. That would be good. But the actual physical suffering that Job undergoes in the loss of his loved ones and his, his things, his possessions... That's a different story. But this is the implication. He wants you to think about it differently. Or he says that God might allow somebody to get really, really sick so that on their deathbed conversion, um, they have a deathbed conversion and then live the rest of their life because they, quote, got religion and they might avoid hardship. It's also interesting to me because of, uh, my parents and my older brother um, all came to faith on their deathbed. And at first, I was really resentful of that. But then also, I'm celebrating because I get eternity to be with them and to grow in our relationship with, with them together. And so that kind of fits a little bit in the context of this, too. So, but Elohim's point is that his friends, the other friends, quote and unquote friends, um, are not nuanced enough and that sometimes it really does appear that someone suffers and they didn't do anything to justify it. It looks that way and it seems to be true. But he's saying, but just, he just says it could be a bigger set of reasons that we don't immediately know. But what does he think Job has done wrong? But what he does think Job is wrong in doing is accusing God of incompetence. I'm going to say that in English. But what he does think is Job is wrong in, in thinking or accusing God of incompetence or being cruel based off of the circumstances. This is where um, Elihu's voice, he does think Job is in the wrong for accusing God in these ways. Without Elihu's voice, I think th the reader, we might believe that Job was um, an impeccable sufferer. He didn't do any wrong. And so here's this perfect image of suffering. But what Elihu's voice does is he challenges us that either God is good all of the time, and all of the time God is good, or there's something else going on here. So Elihu's rebuke of Job's self-righteousness. However, we're warned against thinking that our suffering by nature constitute a challenge to God's integrity. Those things do not equal each other. 
when we do suffer unjustly or what we perceive to be unjust, it doesn't mean, it doesn't equal that God is unjust. It simply means that from our perspective and from our understanding, it doesn't add up or make sense. It doesn't equal this perversion of God. It does equal that we are incapable of thinking the way God thinks. So God. I, I really toyed a lot with this idea, and so I'm going to let God's word speak for itself rather than you hear from me, but this is what God has said. Job 28, we're going to start there, verses 20 through 28. Where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say, only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. For he views the end of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. In the book of Job, it affirms man's capacity to do amazing things. No other creature, it talks about mining and going into the earth and has discovered and seen things that no other creature could discover or see. And yet there's a limit to what we can do. And there are places that we will never, ever get to see or experience this side of heaven. Think about the universe. Think about all of these places. I used the illustration. I, I got to go to Mount Kilimanjaro, and up on the peak, there were just vistas upon vistas that I could never put my feet upon. And those are infinite when you think of the universe and all of the places that God has created and stands not only within but able to stand from without. So with that in mind, I'm going to have Mark, I've got a, a, a news flash. This is an article that came up that he's going to help me read because I needed a professional voice. Can I get that Babylon? This, this, is, FF, uh, this is FNN, the Fellowship News Network. <laughs> Sources confirm local free thinker Jared Olson is calling into question what he calls the absurd idea that God has ever done anything for him, all while inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide in a complex process well beyond his mind's capability of understanding in its entirety. The idea of God is really just holding us back, Olson opined, addressing the members of the philosophy club at an area community college as the membrane across his larynx vibrated to modulate the flow of air from his lungs, making his speech audible to the people listening, whose intricate ear structures then instantly transform the invisible sound waves into abstract thought in their brain's nervous tissue. Olson went on to pursue the line of reasoning even further, claiming that mankind has science, medicine, and mathematics to thank for its continued existence rather than any sort of all-powerful creator, for which there is, in his words, absolutely no evidence. According to eyewitnesses, he made these claims as the surface of his feet rested on continued to spin around the Earth's core without any input from him, all while the only known habitable planet on which he stood rocketed around the center of the galaxy in perfect formation at the unfathomable rate of 490,000 miles per hour. At one point during his expertly crafted speech, Olson reportedly glanced around the room to observe the nods of approval from his peers, his eyes, hundreds of millions of cone and rod cells responding to stimuli in an unimaginably sophisticated procedure as these elaborate structures continued to capture and process an unbelievable volume of input per second. Olson reported 
he was all the more confident from the looks of those around him that he had proved his case. According to Olson, he plans to detail religion's negative influence on society in next week's meeting, which is being held in the annex adjacent to both a Christian homeless shelter and a Catholic hospital. This is FNN. That's why they were professionals, right? Okay, I want you to take your image, whatever your image is, okay, however far you've got your image. Okay, this is the instrument. This is the device that you have created that's going to make your life easier. It's going to accomplish the things that you can only hope for or dream of. And so that you can go off and do the other more important things that you have on your schedule, right? Okay, so I want you to set that up and then ask it to tell you what to do next. Or, even better, ask it to help you create it better. Like, so mine is, is again, I kind of knew where I was headed, but I, I made it in the shape of a human. And this guy's head's way bigger than mine because it needs more brain than what I got, I think. But, like, if you think about it, it can't, it can't really help me. You know, it can't. Not only can it not do what I, this can't do, what I want it to do, but it can't tell me how to make it better. It can't tell me how to accomplish those things that I kind of want it to do. I, even the image that I have is such a bad image, like it can't help correct itself in any way, shape, or form. You could yell at yours, try it. I mean, you don't want to yell, all right. But I don't think it can help. I don't think it can. Job 40, verse 1. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. And then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I ever repay to you, reply to you? I put my hand over my, my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Or can your voice thunder like this? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. And then I myself will admit to you that you, that your own right hand can save you. It's absurd. to think that when we critique or condemn God, we justify ourselves. And it's absurd to think this guy's arms have any more strength or power. I want you to think about telling your image, your image bearer, to correct your artwork.
chapter 42, verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I do not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Maybe you have heard of God. I think those who have suffered see God's hand more practically. Not that as a punishment, but we're desperate for him. It's when things are going wonderfully well that we're like, oh yeah, God's there, it's all great. And often, too often, I get so self-centered that I forget even to look or to acknowledge or to wait or to ask for help. If you listen now, God is speaking now. And he may be asking you the question. Have you discredited his justice? Do you condemn God to justify your own inaction, lack of action, or disobedience. God is making you into something. He is creating you into something new, more beautiful than you can hope for or imagine. I get Jeremiah 18, 1 through 3. Both the prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah, talk about this idea. It says, this is a message that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house, and I will give my message there. And so I went to the potter's house, and I saw him working with clay on the wheel. And he was making a pot from clay. But there was something wrong with the pot. And so the potter used the clay to make another pot. With his hands, he shaped the pot the way he wanted it to be. If you take your image and think about your favorite beverage, most of you know what mine is, black coffee. But think about your favorite beverage. Andrea and I, I think some of you have seen, we've gotten cups, matching cups, so that while well, she's in Arizona, she can drink her coffee her way, and I can drink my coffee my way. But the vessel is what we have in common, the vessel. And I'm such a coffee snob, I have to have a specific kind of cup. Not only is my coffee pot only, wholly, single-use purpose, black coffee, but my cups, they have to be a certain size. Not too big, because then your coffee gets cold. And not too small, because then you're always going to get more coffee. God is shaping you as an instrument. A 
as a device to hold a treasure like Mary. Single use, specific purpose, but the best treasure you can imagine. And sometimes when we're full of ourselves, we get way ahead. And then God's like, well, maybe this cup needs a little bit more fixing. <laughs> and I don't really like the experience. Because sometimes I think this cup is doing okay. Tonight or this afternoon, um, a couple of us are going to Stanley to the chosen and again I do not get any uh, financial remuneration Patrick um, but it is the most beautiful depiction of Jesus I've seen so far single use vessel and that message that Christmas is declaring that the Pots that had been made up to that point had all missed the mark. They hadn't quite been there. Not in the movie section, but in the practical application of human beings. All had fallen short. And so God sent his son to carry a treasure. I'm going to pray, and then I think we're going to get one more song in. But I want you to think about you as an image bearer, as a vessel carrying a special message. And there are people we meet every day who don't know, who have been misled, who have been shown a Jesus which is kind of ugly and distorted. And maybe we've been the ones doing it. I don't know. But God has a way of using our best, and sometimes our worst, for his glory and for all of our benefit. We're going to pray. Father God, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for the perfect image bearer. Thank you for loving us in spite of our arrogance and self-centeredness. And I pray for your spirit to just move through us, that we would be receptacles, that would be open. We would receive that message and then carry it with us so that more people would hear. God, we pray for your spirit, again, that we wouldn't get so worked up in our expectations, but that we would look to see what you are doing and join you there. God, I pray all of this in your name. Amen. One last time. All right, guys. Sit, stand, wave your arms around. Let's have some fun worshiping together.
right. It's Christmas. Um, go out and love and serve the Lord. Ah, thanks for being here. <laughs>